test, test. Good. Awesome. So uh, again, good morning. My name is Chris. This is my first time being up here, and it's made me a little nervous. Uh, not to be in front of people. I used to teach communications equipment to Marines and, uh, you know, tough crowd. So <laughs> what I'm nervous about is getting everything right. So I've used a lot of scripture. I will be marking it up here. And uh, so I if there is anything that's incorrect or just, you know, just a little bit off or flat out wrong, come speak to me. I will, I will be around. So when I did used to teach uh, stuff to Marines, I would do this in three phases. I would first tell them what it is. What does this thing do? What it does. And then lastly, how to make it do that, because that's the important thing, for them to be able to go off and be successful with that. So we're going to start with what it is. What I'm going to be talking about today is that, you know, among the many blessings from God, free will <laughs> is one of those blessings. The, the blessing to choose what we do in our daily lives. And, uh, you know, it didn't just come by itself. It came with a guide. And so the Bible acts as that guide for us to use to guide our free will, our use of that free will. So that we may choose, and we don't just fall into it, we have to choose, the victory over sin offered to us by God, uh, made possible through the sacrifice of his son. So that was painless. That's step one. That's what it is. What it does. So for what it does, we're going to start with, uh, there is no Galatians chapter 2, verse 22, but that's a typo. It's Galatians chapter 3. Verses 22 through 24. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith that was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. So the Bible comes in two parts, as we know, uh, Old Testament, New Testament. The Old Testament, I always think about, you know, with, uh, referring to the old law and uh, a time when people tried to accomplish the impossible task of meriting forgiveness and meriting ascendancy. So, and the New Testament is about our promise by faith. And to give us a little more context, uh, back it up to verse 19 of Galatians chapter 3. Why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator, until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. So the seed is Jesus, and until Jesus came around, we had the law, which was added, the Bible tells us, because of transgressions, meaning humanity's transgressions. Skip that part again, chapter 3. Uh, meaning that hum uh, humans use their free will to disobey God, and humanity, like me, needs structure. That's why I do the three-step process here. God didn't do anything in, in the Old Testament because it, was, uh, because it was Tuesday. You know, it was because what man chose to do with the blessings that he had given them. So let's go back and look at an example of that in Exodus. Exodus chapter 20, and starting from verse 1. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and you shall have no other gods before me. And we know where, you know where we're at at this point. You know, this is, after, this is after God had given so many things. He had freed them. He had given them um, manna, fish, water, all sorts of stuff. And, uh, and so they had seen his power. And then after, after this part that we've just read, uh, the Lord goes on to give the rest of the Ten Commandments and the rest of the details of the law. And the people listen to everything God said. And they never sinned again. And they all lived happily ever after. Uh, actually, 12 chapters later, they build a golden calf. So that is, uh, is uh, 
comical effects more. Um, so that didn't take long. Numbers chapter 16, Korah's rebellion. Man transgresses against God within the tribes of Israel. So the list goes on. We, we could fill slides and slides up here, but we're going to move on. I like that it's called the law. I like that it's called the law because we as, as humans have our own system of law. So we understand what the word law means and how it works. And within that system of law, we focus a lot on precedence. And the Old Testament sets a lot of precedence. In our man-made system of law, there's a term called supersteri decisis. Uh, I, had to, I had to look this up, trying to find the coolest word for precedence. And uh, it was used for important precedence that is resistant or immune from being overturned without regard to whether correctly decided in the first place. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, we're, we're going to just take something and say, okay, that's the way it is, without ever actually looking. It's, it's an acceptance that the way that was decided was good. And so the Old Testament sets a precedence that man transgresses against God. And... Uh, there's not really a, you know, there's not really a, a, a counter to that. Uh, there's no argument that humans sin, and it's been established in the Old Testament that we do so. And I mean, they had a fiery mountain with thunder and trumpets and all sorts of stuff telling them not to sin. And 12 chapters later, they build a golden calf. So let's connect that with the New Testament. Let's go to, uh, so the Old Testament wasn't just the first thing God tried uh, before moving on to a different tactic to get us to do what he wanted. His strategy wasn't missing anything. It was man that was missing something, and that was faith. So uh, let's, let's go to 1 Corinthians 10. And uh, at 1 Corinthians 10, uh, as I, the first thing I noticed when I looked at this uh, scripture was that this whole section is titled, titled, Avoid Israel's Mistakes. And in it, Paul tells the Corinthians, starting in verse 11, Now these things happened to them as an example, that they were written for our, and they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. The Old Testament is important to the overall narrative that inspires our use of free will today. It sets a precedence, superstary decisis level precedence, that, uh, that humans are bound to sin, uh, imprisoned to sin, or imprisoned by sin, as different translations of Paul's letter to the Galatians reads, and therefore cannot keep God's old law. The law only offers condemnation then, and God isn't setting us up for failure without a way out. So on to verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man, and God is faithful, and who will, not, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. We will sin. We know that. We all sin in some form. But we have our free will, and we have the Bible to guide us towards the promise by faith, not condemnation by sin. catching up with myself. So, we covered what it is, free will and the Bible to guide us. We covered what it does. Offers a promise by faith if we choose it, and we have to choose it. We don't just fall in. Now let's cover how to make it do that. How do we choose the offered promise by faith? And this isn't an all-inclusive list. Uh, it's a, it isn't a list at all. It's kind of a, kind of a guidance. But, uh, but there are, there are some, some hard stop things that need to be done, and I'm not really going to cover a lot of that. But uh, simple answer, follow the guidance of the Bible. Specifically the Bible, because it is not the only guidance out there, and Christians aren't the only ones with free will. We have created for ourselves a human society that provides its own guidance, and some of it is obviously not for us here, right? Like, like terrorism, human trafficking, stuff like that. But because some other things are so incredibly more tame than that, I, I've, I've called it in the past a gray area. 
And uh, I called it a gray area for a long time, uh, realizing that I was just putting f smoke and mirror in front of the sins that I was rationalizing as, as being, you know, hey, it's not, it's not terrorism or human trafficking, right? So I had too much attachment and have rationalized to keep using my free will to choose them instead of what I should be. So we humans often adapt habits and personality traits because they are supported by our man-made environment. Uh, so I was a Marine for nine years. And while I was in the Marine Corps, I was in, a, I was in an environment that encouraged and supported uh, the use of bad language. We all used just bad language all the time. Anybody who's been in the military has probably experienced the same thing. And I have distanced myself that, from that. As, as time went on, I look back and I say, man, I, I probably sounded really stupid. But I had a choice. I had a choice, and I was choosing the bad language. And you know how I know I had a choice? Uh, Jenna would call. I, I'd pick up the phone, and I would be the most upstanding, well-spoken gentleman of all time. And as soon as I hung up, it was, you know, back to profanity and, and bad jokes. Uh, so I was there in the middle of an environment that, that supported and encourage that. I had a free choice the entire time, and, uh, you know, I was choosing that. The Bible offers us a counter option when your environment doesn't agree with your faith. The Bible tells us to have faith despite the world around us and the actions or behaviors it will support or encourage. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Ephesians likes to hide on me. Paul writes, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Skip to verse 17. It goes on. So this I say, and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their mind being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their hearts. Thanks. Skip to verse 21. If indeed you have heard him, and you have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. So the promise by faith is the truth, and the world around us is deceit. And if you let it, it will make you like those mentioned who are excluded from the life of God because of ignorance. But we have the Bible. We can't claim ignorance. We know the truth. We need to be renewed in the spirits of our mind and reject the sins in the world around us, whether it supports it in or encourages or not. So what do we do in place of sin? What are we supposed to do? Uh, skip ahead to verse 29. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear it. Do our minds or mouths refer to common phrases in the world that are fun to say, but otherwise useless? Little one-liners we picked up somewhere, maybe from a movie or a favorite TV show or a stand-up comic. Is that good for the edification according to the needs of the moment? Does it give grace to those who hear it? So God wants us to be efficient and productive in what we say. That's not all, though. Uh, still in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 18. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. We're told here not to sit around and get drunk because that is dissipation. It, it means just squandering your gifts and your time and your efforts on useless things. In what other ways can we squander our gifts, I wonder? How do we feel after we 
binge watch seasons of something. Uh, make, make the most of your time because the days are evil and distracting and not the truth. So God wants us to be efficient and productive in what we say and in how we spend our time. Why do all of this? Well, the Bible provides that too. Uh, Titus, which likes to hide on me more, chapter 2, verse 11. I'm going to read 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared. For the grace of God has appeared. Where was I? Oh, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. We've been hearing that word zeal a lot lately. That's pretty straightforward, though. We don't want to give up our bad habits, and it's really hard to follow through with the choice to do better, though. It, it, it is. It's, it's tough. So, again, uh, Luke chapter 23, verses 46 and 47. And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Jesus had a choice. And he chose the hard thing, even when it killed him. And he set the example. He followed through. And we are called to do that very same thing in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, first verse. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So basically, into our Father's hands commit your spirit. Follow Jesus. On to verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Given all that, it's easier to surround yourself in an environment that will support your Christianity and your Christian lifestyle, and you should definitely do that. We are here. But don't forget that you're not here all the time. You're in other environments as well and you should provide support in the other environments you find yourself in. Not everyone uh, is as sure as you possibly are. Not everyone is as compelled as you possibly are. And your resolve to live a Christian life despite your environment and what it may support or encourage uh, can be very inspiring to others. You contribute to converting those environments to supporting and encouraging Christian behavior. And uh, what I've heard to refer to as a Christ-like excellence. Christ was excellent, we emulate him. So, Christ-like excellence. I'm not saying put up posters at work and make it a Christian environment. That may be inappropriate per company policies or whatever, and uh, you have to know your audience. A while back in a Sunday class, while we were talking about zeal, uh, I think it was Robin, she's not here to ask, um, she mentioned a silent zeal. And it is the first time that I had heard that and it stuck with me. It stuck with me. I believe that a silent zeal can sometimes have a greater effect than telling people, I am Christian and you can be also. It uses something that uh, writers and filmmakers have been, have been trying to get right for years. Show, don't tell. Showing is not as powerful as telling. Um, you ever met a crossfitter? You know, they'll, they'll tell you. <laughs> As a Christian, you have an advantage here in the show, don't tell, because you get to flex your spiritual muscles whenever, whenever you want by displaying uh, that Christ-like excellence that I mentioned. Even if it might be inappropriate to talk about religion at work, 
It is never inappropriate to be an upstanding person who doesn't waste their words or their time and doesn't compromise themselves for the world around them and the activities that it may support or encourage. It will show. And it's easier said than done, of course. To modify one's lifestyle, it must be a conscious choice. You shouldn't let yourself be swayed haphazardly by the world around you uh, and the convenience of sinful behavior because you have to decide who you are and who you want to be. You don't want to miss out on your victory because you didn't feel like it, but you can't really quantify the value of the things that you did in place of your Christian lifestyle. And you're going to have hard days. And the hard days are the worst. Because those are the days where you start to compromise. Those are the days where on your way home from work you say, man, I tell you what, that was a hard day. I'm going to, I'm going to get this, do this, participate in these activities. And you, you decide to serve yourself at the expense of everything and everyone else. And on those days, it is easiest to fall into worldly behavior. Realize that those hard days are the most important to your lifestyle change. They set your new standard. If on a bad day you veer from the Christian lifestyle, you're setting a line in the sand and you're saying, all right, everything over this line, I can be not Christian, and then that side I can be. But then that line, I'm telling you, it creeps. It creeps and moves and you start to rationalize, well, this day is between that day and the line, so now I can, yeah, it does. The line is deceitful, and instead, choose the truth. You need to stay the strongest so you can defeat every bad day, no matter how bad. Set your boundaries, and the boundaries of your faith, in the statement that, all thing, that through God, all things are possible. On those bad days, what do you do instead? You go to God in prayer, First Thessalonians, right? Pray without ceasing. Our Bibles offer on top of that, catch up here, the letter of Jude. We'll start in verse 17. I like the, uh, the poetic writing of Jude, by the way. It's kind of cool. Uh, so verse 17, but you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is saying, read the Bible on those bad days. Those words are there. On to verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourselves, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Why? What happens then? Verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, and to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. So that's why. If you know that you haven't been choosing the Christian lifestyle and would like some prayers or support. Or if you would like to take that next step in the big show, don't tell march towards the ultimate victory and be baptized, we paid the water bill. We are always ready to provide the environment to support and encourage that kind of behavior. So if you need anything at all, please come forward as we stand and sing.